there might be a lot of things you can say when you get home tonight. But something that you will not be able to say is that you did not go to church. <laughs> We've been in church. <laughs> Amen. What an honor and a privilege this is to me uh, to be able to come and be a part of this meeting and to be in one of what I believe the greatest churches that we've got. I'm very thankful for you, uh, for your friendship. I'm thankful for Brother Wilton and the work that the Lord's done through him. I, I say this, having preached in a few different churches, you can feel when you walk on a property uh, when the Lord's there. And the Lord's with Sweetwater Baptist Church. And I'm honored to be here. I, I can't speak highly enough of the men you've had in this meeting and how Honored it is to be here and intimidating that it is to be here. I, I said in a promotional video we made for the meeting that I've driven hundreds of miles to go sit in a conference and hear the men that you've had here. We need this meeting in North Louisiana. And I'm thankful for you and your pastor and the vision that you have to put this together. Uh, Brother Bob and Brother Herb I've met because of Brother Bill and Brother Jerry. Being friends with them, having them, preaching with them, uh, it's just a blessing to be a part of the family of God. And because of all of this, now I've met Brother George. And what an honor. And how intimidating to preach behind what God used you to do tonight. Incredible. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your mission. Amen. I'm blessed. I could, I could go on with pleasantries, uh, but I realize we're getting late. Amen. It's a Louisiana Friday night, so keep your fiddle and bow till tomorrow. Amen. But I've got a word I believe God would have us to hear, and I hope tonight it will minister to your heart. If you have your Bible, if you will, open to the 32nd chapter of the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 32. I'm going to invite you, if you can and you will, to stand with us in honor of His word as we read. And if you'll stand with me while I read my text... I'll let you sit down for the next hour and a half. How about that? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm just going to read you one verse, uh, and, and we've got a message that will come from both sides of this verse that I hope tonight uh, we can communicate as the Lord has given. Exodus 32, verse 30. The Bible says, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. I want you to catch that phrase again. I will go up unto the Lord. And I want to preach a message to you tonight and remind you to be conscious of everything you've heard as I feel the Lord has laced our hearts together this evening. I want to ask you the question, and close the night with this challenge, is there anyone left who will go back up the mountain? Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, we need you. I'm so honored tonight to be in your presence. Oh, it's good to be with good men. Oh, it's good to be in a good church. But to be in the presence of Jehovah. God, I thank you tonight for being with us. And I ask you tonight to bless the ministry that's already touched our heart through song and through sermon, through the fellowship of these sweet people, this wonderful pastor, the vision, God, that's brought us here together. But God, as we come now to this portion of the service, I pray that afresh and anew you would fall on our hearts and bring us to Jesus. Lord, give me the grace tonight and liberty to say what you've asked me to say. And Lord, let me say it with all of my heart. I don't desire to be heard or seen or even remembered. God, I just pray tonight that when we leave this place, the one that we hold in most high regard will be Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Move in power. Do what you do. Be God in this place. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And you can be seated. Is there anyone here who will go back up the mountain? I want you to understand tonight that in the separation that sin brought, you have on one side of the equation a holy, just God. And on the other side of the equation, you have me. 
an unjust, unworthy sinner. And there is no way for these two to have liberty and fellowship without divine intervention. And it just so happens that God provided a mediator to stand between God and man. The Bible says, Paul writing to Timothy, the man, Jesus Christ, who came to take the hand of the Most High God and the hand of the deepest, darkest sinner and to reconcile us into fellowship and good standing with the Holy God. Now, in this particular passage of Scripture, you have Moses, one of the most prolific people leaders that ever lived. And Moses has led the people of Israel in the Exodus into the wilderness and they have reached a milestone in their journey in which God has called Moses up into the mount to meet with him in his glory. And there would be a discussion here. And to what we talked about tonight, God would give him two things. The Word of God and the house of God. In this discussion and this time, Moses would receive from our God the instructions concerning the law, the tablets of stone that he would write with his own finger, the very Word of God and the law that he had for man. And he would give him the dimensions and the description of what would become the tabernacle of God. An incredible correspondence. I believe you would agree with that tonight. And so in this time that Moses receives this instruction, there's something going on at the foot of the mountain. (laughs) He's been gone for a minute. And in the time that he's been gone, people did what people do. They began to wander around and question, what do we do now? And they came to the conclusion that while Moses is up there goofing off, We need to find something to do, something that would suit us, something that would please us. And so Aaron would come up with this bright idea. (laughs) Give me all your jewelry, give me all this gold, and we're going to make something for us to become an object of worship. And so he takes these things and he makes this golden calf. And nothing short of debauchery begins to ensue. There's a festival-like atmosphere, if you will, a a, a thing of worship, a thing of praise, of adoration as they worship and debauch themselves with one another in sexual promiscuity and everything under the sun. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? And God looks down from heaven and recognizes that this golden calf is here in the praises, receiving the honor and the glory for the things that he had done. They'd worship that golden calf and say of that golden calf, it was you who led us out of Egypt and our bondage. And as God heard this, his anger was kindled against the children of Israel. And as God became angered, the the, 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 the conversation shifted. <laughs> And now he begins to speak to Moses from his heart in wrath and in anger and even repentance for what he had done for those people. And here we have a picture of Moses as a foreshadow, if you will, of what would be our divine intercessor. The one who would come and stand in the gap between sinful man and holy God and make a way. And listen, Jesus was God to man, but He also came and became a man to pay this ultimate price to His Father. He was a representation of God to us, and He was the one who stood between us and Him. In this glimpse of Scripture, we have Moses in the same predicament and God and Moses in this place reveals something about the heart of Moses that I hope tonight and challenge you tonight that we'll be able to see in the hearts and lives of the people of the Sweetwater Baptist Church and the friends and family who've joined us this week. Moses looks down to the storm taking place Having heard the heart of God, he goes down and he confronts the people. You remember the story? He so frustrated himself that the very tablets hewn from stone that God had written with his own finger, the law, he throws the stones down and they're broken. He confronts the people about their sin. 
And then he has to make a decision. He could walk away from the people or he could go back to the Father and stand in the gap for them. This stiff-necked, rebellious, sinful people. I reluctantly recorded the State of the Union last night. I went home after the feast <laughs> that I was not invited to, but I went to anyway. <laughs> Amen. He said, all the team. I said, well, <laughs> I don't know what that means tonight. Now, tonight I'm going back with confidence. You understand? <laughs> but last night I peaked. And I saw Brother George, and I said, we're in. Amen. So I feasted with the brethren, and what a time we had. I went home, and I was too tired to get mad. So I said, I'll wait and watch it in the morning. That was a bad idea because it ruined my day. So I turned on Sleepy Joe, and I listened to the State of the Union. And I want you to know tonight that the State of the Union is fabricated and sinful. We're a broken people in a broken land. And the only thing that can fix it. We're too far gone for man's instrumentality. The only thing that will fix the mess we're in is a move of God. And I'm praying tonight for that. Amen. <laughs> we need tonight a band of people who are willing to stand in the gap for humanity. You know what's interesting, and I, I want to make this point tonight, is that Moses, and the characteristic tonight that I pray we can grab a hold of, is that Moses was burdened for people. And somewhere in all of our dividing lines, whether it be racial or sexual or uh, 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 cultural or, or political, all the things we use to chop up all the different groups, all the things that would even divide the people within this room tonight, I think that somewhere along the way, what we've forgotten is that we're all people. And it doesn't matter what political persuasion Adam was. It doesn't matter what his race was. It doesn't matter what cultural standing he had. Adam sinned, and because of his sin, death is passed unto all men. And I don't dodge that bullet because Adam didn't look like me. I don't dodge that bullet because Adam don't walk like me. I don't dodge that bullet because Adam doesn't worship like me or vote like me. I got in on that because Adam was just folks, and so am I. <laughs> And there's something to be said tonight about our understanding that the sin of the human race involves us tonight. And it's hard for us to sit in the lighthouse and throw stones at the darkness and wait on them to repent when I think we've heard very well tonight with the freedom that we've been given, we have a responsibility to go into the darkness tonight and shine the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. But hear me well tonight, you'll never do it unless you have a burden for people. Never. Listen to the Word. The Bible says in verse 7 through verse 10, let me read you this. The Lord said unto Moses, Go get you down for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone that my wrath wax hot against them them and I will consume them and I'll make of you a great nation God says to Moses get out of the way I'm going to kill all of them and you'll be my new Abraham and years later at Sweetwater Baptist Church Vacation Bible School the kids will be marching around singing Father Moses had many sons amen and many sons had Father Moses what a temptation this may have been to someone as carnal as us tonight. But Moses wanted no part of this because even though they were a sinful people and even though they were a stiff-necked people and even though they were a people who made God very angry tonight, Moses still saw them as his people. 
And I want to challenge you tonight, Sweetwater Church and people of God, when we look in this world at the rainbow flags, at the fussing in the streets, at the fighting and the feuding, and all the things that we despise tonight, may we remember that those people are still people. People that you and I have been called to preach the gospel to. People you and I have been called to reach with the gospel of Jesus. People that we've been called to serve called to minister to. I don't have to wave the pom-poms of their sin, but I have a responsibility tonight in Jesus Christ to love the unlovable just as the Father loved me. You talk about begging people to come to Jesus. Paul said it was as if God was in us, beseeching you, be reconciled to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. So let me agree with Brother George tonight. If God is not too big to beg them to come to Jesus, then may none of us ever be too big or too offended to fall on our knees and beg someone to come to Jesus. He was broken for the people. Listen in verse 11 through verse 14. The Bible says, And Moses besought the Lord, his God, and said, Why does your wrath wax hot against the people which you brought forth out of the land of Egypt? God, it wasn't that calf. It was you. Amen. Why, why are you mad? You're the one that did that. With great power and a mighty hand, wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief <laughs> did he bring them out and slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath. Repent of this evil against thy People. He told Moses they were his people. <laughs> Moses said, no, 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 no. They're still your people against thy people. Remember Abraham. Don't remember Moses. It's not about me. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self that you said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed forever, and they will inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. You see the anger of God in verse 7 through verse 10, the advocacy of Moses in verse 11 through verse 13, and you see the answer to his plea from God in verse 14. The Lord repented. That's a big statement. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his own people. How could something motivate such a God? I'll tell you what I think. I think it was the willingness of someone so close to him to go back up the mountain. He could have stayed down there. He could, have, he could have bid them farewell. He could have been the next Abraham. He could have had a great nation come from him. He could have been all of those things. But he had a burden for those people. So he went back up the mountain. Let me tell you what else Moses had. Moses was not only burdened for people. Moses was broken over their sin. Now I understand tonight we all have an understanding and, and I think an appreciation of the fact that my sin should bother me. To the extent that my sin should bring conviction in my life. But I do believe there's a separation of us looking at other people's sin and taking our own personal ownership in this reality. It was one Jonathan Edwards who came in the late 1700s and brought this nation to her knees with one sermon titled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now we'll sit in the house tonight and if I say we're all sinners, we'll raise our hands and say amen. Be quiet on me while I'm preaching good. None of us, Right? None righteous, not one. All sin comes short of the glory of God. Not a just man in the world that does good and sins not. We'll take our ownership in the fact that we've sinned. But I want to tell you something tonight. If the judgment of God that does not seem to bother us in this country, if the judgment of God falls in this room because of one person's sin, I got bad news for you, sweetheart. That means the judgment of God's going to get me and you too. If the roof falls on one in judgment, it's going to fall on all of us in judgment. And we're just a product of who we are. So our detachment from the sins of this world could lead to our own condemnation if we don't recognize that God still uses people to stand in the gap between holy God and sinful man. Somebody get back up that mountain tonight. 
Somebody that didn't sin. Somebody that didn't do it. Somebody that's not guilty. Somebody that's never went the way that they went but still recognizes tonight the detriment of their sin before God to man and the brokenheartedness of God over the sins of the people that He created. It should break our hearts tonight if it breaks God's heart tonight. It should hurt our hearts tonight if it hurts God's heart tonight. He was broken over their sin. Verse 30 and verse 32, it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, you have sinned a great sin. And now I'll go back up the mountain. And now I will go up unto the Lord peradventure. I shall make an atonement for your sin. You know what he's saying? I'm going to go to God and I'm going to offer in exchange for your pardon my life I'm going to go up the mountain and be willing to give whatever God will let me give to set you free peradventure that God would allow me to make an atonement for your sin and Moses returned unto the Lord and said oh this people have sinned a great sin he didn't wait on them to confess he bowed before God and said These people have hurt you. So when we harden our hearts and we get mad and shake our fist at the sinners that don't sin like we do, might I remind you tonight that the heart of God being grieved is the heart of the same God that you and I desire to please tonight. And there are things that I do for my wife that have nothing to do with me, but I love her so much that I want to make her happy. I don't care about flowers, but I've spent a lot of money on flowers. Is anybody listening to me? I don't care about jewelry. My wedding ring is made of tungsten steel. It cost $18, but I've paid a lot of money for jewelry that I don't like and I don't wear. Amen. But it makes her happy, and I love her. And I'm telling you tonight, I love God. And when the people of this world that we belong to And I would say more dramatically tonight, the people of this nation that we belong to. Maybe more personally tonight, the people of this community that we belong to. Do you know the two greatest controversies I've had in my 10 years of pastor of Antioch Baptist Church? One was because I spoke publicly about a sex ring in town between businessmen and women who they were paying the bills for to pass these girls around. I had threats over that. And another was because I prayed that a bar would shut down. And that was the two most controversial things in our community that I've done as a pastor. And I say bring it on because if it grieves the heart of God, we can't be silent about it. If it grieves the heart of God and on the other hand brings His judgment on people, we have to get back up the mountain because we're broken hearted over what sin is doing not only to the people but to the God of the people. Moses went back up that mountain broken over sin. He said, I'm going to go up per adventure. I'll make atonement for it. Moses goes and said, these people have sinned a great sin and have made gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which you've written. You talk about serving somebody? What about sacrifice? Moses loved those people so much. He said, if they can't go to heaven, then I don't want to go either. That's big. What did Paul say? I'd be accursed for my countrymen. Moses is up the mountain pleading with God with a burden for people, a brokenness over sin. And I want to get you to the result tonight of what he did. The Bible goes on and says in chapter 33 in verse 17 that the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying don't wait till you need faith to get faith. I'm saying don't wait till you need God to get to know Him. I'm saying don't wait till it's time to pray to start praying. (laughs) 
We have the privilege tonight to get to know God. We have the privilege tonight to know Him through worship and praise and the study of His Word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We have the privilege tonight to come before God in prayer and ask the God of heaven to get in on whatever it is that's going on in this earth. And if you and I have the distinct privilege tonight to stand in the gap for the people of this world, and represent the people to God just as Moses did. Can you imagine the privilege that he had then that you and I have bestowed upon us tonight not only to represent the people to God, but then to go back to this world and represent God to the people. An ambassadorship of God. To go out in this world and tell him about a God who's not happy with our sin. He's not all right with our sin. But he made a way for us to be forgiven of our sin and to have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me tell you this. You know how Moses got to this result? One, he was broken over sin. He had a burden for the people. But he was a battle-tested child of God. This is not the first time that Moses has had to deal with the Lord. This is not the first time that Moses has had to deal with this stiff-necked people. Moses had a desire to see these people through and to help them no matter what the cost. And he shows us as much in that he calls God to remembrance. And God reminds him that I know you by name. Can I say to you, Sweetwater Baptist Church, the more light that God sheds on our path, the more accountability we have to walk in that light. And when God lets us have meetings like we've had and hear messages like we've had and enter into worship in the presence of God like we have. Oh, we love Moses, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. But the reality is he had to put his shoes back on and go to work, amen, to do what God had called him to do. So the call tonight is for you and me to take everything God's done, recognize God did this for a reason, and we ought to be a better church than we've ever been because of what God's done here this week. Moses came out firing. God said, I'm doing this for you because I know you. Can I say to you tonight, God says to us, I will do this because I know you. I will help you because I know you. I called you by name. When you were lost and undone, without God or His Son, the Savior reached down for you. He took my feet out of the, somebody help me tonight, out of the miry clay and put my feet on a solid rock. I was lost and undone. Without God, He came to me. Amen. And He called me by name right where I was. And He reached into the depth and the darkness of my sin and he brought me to the oh, somebody into the light of the Lord Jesus Christ he took that poor girl that those scribes and Pharisees come hauling in and threw down before him and he saved that girl set her free and to the chagrin of everyone in the audience his next statement was I am the light of the world and in me is no darkness. And if any man follow, oh, come on. If any man follow me, he will not walk in darkness, but he'll have that light of life in him. That's why we have Bible conference. That's why we have revival. That's why we keep going back up the mountain so we can take the gospel of Jesus Christ and tell this world about the light of the world. Take them out of their darkness, put them in the light, and then put the light in them so that they can go back to their family and their home and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was a battle-tested child of God, and that earned him favor when it came time to intercede. Don't wait till it's time to pray to learn how to pray. <laughs> what do we have tonight as battle-tested children of God? We have the ministry of prayer. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 8, the Bible said, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination unto God, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The Bible says in Jeremiah 33, 3, God said, Call on me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. And that word phrase, great and mighty things, has been described as a gather of grapes at an altitude you can't ascend to and a magnitude that you can't calculate. Trust the Lord and do what he's told us to do. As a battle-tested child of God, we have the ministry of prayer tonight. Can I ask you this? Is prayer a defining characteristic of your walk with God? Don't wait till it's time to need him, to get to know him. Amen. Let's pray and do business with God as he's called us to do. We don't only have the ministry of prayer, we have the security of presupposed victory. <laughs> Greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world, John said. John also said, whatsoever is born of God 
overcomes the world and here's the victory that overcomes this world even our faith could you imagine what a privilege it is to go into the battlefield and know we're going to win even when I suffer defeat I have victory what a privilege tonight to be able to walk in the victorious grace of God and the ministry of prayer the security of perpetual victory, and the power of peace with God the Bible says in the gospel of John chapter 1 that he came unto his own and his own received him not <laughs> But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Can I ask you again tonight, do these three characteristics define your relationship with God? Can you say tonight that you have the power of God in and on your life? He said to those who believed, he gave the power of God. Can I ask you tonight, does intimacy with God define your relationship? To become the sons of God. Of God, and listen to what he said to as many as believe on his name. Can you say tonight that power and intimacy and faith describe your relationship with God? Because I'm here to tell you tonight, those are the characteristics of somebody who'll go back up the mountain. I want to appeal to you tonight on two fronts. One, if you're lost tonight, I want you to be saved with all my heart. And I want to say this for, for a bigger reason. I say a bigger, but for a broader reason. Of course tonight, I want you to go to heaven when you die. I don't want you to go to hell with all my heart. But I want you to know there is more to being a child of God than getting out of hell and going to heaven. We need you. More than ever. We need you on the team. We need you on the firing line. We used to sing them songs when we were kids in church. If you're in the battle of the Lord and right, get on the firing line. Amen. We used to sing songs at Bible school. Onward, Christian soldier, marching on to war. I heard a missionary from South Mexico say one time that the church in America is the best trained army that never went to war. We need you tonight. We need you tonight. I heard a story about a man that got on a cruise ship years ago. And as they were going across the water, one of the men that was on the ship walked outside and saw him sitting at the banister of the ship eating cheese and crackers. He walked up to the man and said to him, Sir, we have some of the finest dining halls on this ship that you'll ever eat in in your entire life. And the man teared up and said, Sir, you don't understand. I'm poor. And it cost me everything I had just to get a ticket to sail on this ship. And the man from the ship said, sir, you misunderstood. It's included in your ticket. I want you to go to heaven. And I don't want you to go to hell. And I believe a lot of us have that settled. But what I'm telling you tonight is much more than where you'll spend eternity. We need you right now to help us get back up the mountain. To help us stand in the gap between sinful man and holy God. And remind God, amen, that we still care for these people. By bringing their name before the Father in prayer and begging God to save their... we got to get this justice out of our mind. That they get what they deserve. Beloved, if we got what we deserve, we'd all be in hell tonight. How dare we assume that there's one out there tonight that deserves justice when you and I are sitting in the lap of grace making such a statement. Lord, help us tonight to recognize that justice would condemn us all to hell. Our privilege tonight is to take those who should justfully be where we should justfully be and stand before God and beg Him to be patient with them and do the work of the Holy Spirit in their heart and let the gospel touch them and let Jesus save their soul because we too need them to come get in on this thing. We need you tonight. We need help tonight to go back up the mountain. Listen to what the Bible says. As you turn over in the page, you find in chapter 34, the Lord said unto Moses in verse 1, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. What are you saying to me? I'm saying that because one went up the mountain, there was restoration. There was a fix. Because Moses was willing to stand in the gap and go before God on behalf of the people and go to the people on behalf of God because he was willing to go back up the mountain, God said, I know that it cost us everything, but I'm willing to restore it. Because Moses went back up the mountain. Listen to verse 9. The Bible said, and he said to God, If now I found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people. 
and pardon our iniquity and take away our sin and take us for thine inheritance. And God said, Behold, God said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I'll do marvels <laughs> such as have not been done in all the earth nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible and awesome a thing to be revered thing that I will do with thee. Jesus came with a group of fishermen and tax collectors, if you will, commoners like me and you. And he gave them the most incredible task that you could ever imagine. He tells 11 men, I want you to go therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. Can I tell you tonight, if Sweetwater Baptist Church was the only church on planet earth, he would give us the same commission. Go therefore into all nations and preach the gospel unto every creature and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. But he sandwiches this charge between two incredible promises. He says, before that, all the power that's in heaven and earth is given unto me. And he says, on the end of it, I'll be with you always, even till the ends of the earth. I'm telling you tonight, we don't have an excuse to not get back up that mountain. If we tonight can reestablish a brokenness over sin, a burden for people, and raise up a generation of battle-tested people of God who are willing to stand in the gap, I believe with all my heart, there's not only the possibility, but the probability of Holy Ghost revival if we'll get back up the mountain. Father, I love you. God, I thank you tonight for the honor to be a part of this meeting. Lord, to hear what we've heard, to see what we've seen, to experience what we've experienced. God, to, to be in your presence. There's no doubt that you've been with us this week. God, as we come to this invitation at the Friday night service, it would be my prayer tonight that we'd take inventory in our heart. Lord, I, I pray I, I would all, we would all ask ourselves, as I will too, am I really burdened for people? Do I really care? Do I really love others? Am I broken over sin? Am I hurt? To, when I look at the world tonight, am I just mad? Or am I hurt tonight because of what the condition of this nation is doing to the heart of my Father? Lord, I, I pray with such a burden and with such brokenness we'll engage in the ministry <clears throat> so that we can fight these fights, so that we can stand in the battle. And through the time of testing that comes with staying in the fight and not growing weary.